Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Run podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. I hope that you're all doing very well. Today, I'm really pleased to welcome to the show Eugene Ellis, who is a psychotherapist. He's also an author of a new book, The Race Conversation. Uh, He's a public speaker as well on all issues of race, uh, diversity, difference, intersectionality. He is the founder and director of the Black African and Asian Therapy Network, which is a network of therapists committed to engaging and addressing psychological needs of the Black, African, South Asian people. His book, The Race Conversation, which is an essential guide to creating life-changing dialogue, explores all intersections of race and trauma. We're going to talk a bit about trauma as well. Also, nonverbal communication of race and how we might even begin to think about having those conversations and also addressing them within ourselves. It's a brilliant book. Uh, All the links will be in the show notes as always. This conversation that we're having today is very important to me because as a black woman therapist, in my 20 plus years of practice, working in private practice and also working within the NHS, offering corporate therapy. I've, I've gone into companies and given therapy as well, corporate, you know, stress management strategies. It's been very apparent to me and also quite concerning that not only was I an anomaly, you know, I would hear comments such as, oh, a black therapist or, oh, a black woman therapist. So I, it appeared that I was an anomaly, but also that black therapists are very underrepresented in the UK. And that is in private practice, but, but specifically within the NHS. And we, you know, Eugene and I will talk about that, uh, our reasons for perhaps why that is the case, but also about how you might begin to think about becoming a therapist if you felt inclined to do so. One of the things that I've always found interesting is that I've I've had a very diverse client group always from the time I began my private practice, which is how I started working. I've always had, first of all, uh, a pri- quite, I mean, Eugene and I talk about this as well, but I've always had a even mix of men and women that come to therapy. However, uh, the there hasn't, I, I want to say there hasn't been a diverse, but it has been diverse, but it has mostly been white people, people who may identify it as white. So I would say it's very small percentage of black clients. Uh, but I do, I do have black clients, both men and women. And, you know, there's something about that. And I think there needs to be more research on that. You know, for, for a start, why do black people not go to therapy? Why do they not seek therapy? Is it because, you know, and if they do seek therapy, why do they not start? Is it because they don't see a representation of themselves as therapists? Uh, is it that there's not enough male, black male therapists, which there aren't? And we talk about that as well. Um, But also, you know, why is that the case? It could be many things. So we, (laughs) I don't want to jump ahead too too quickly here, but it is quite interesting. And Eugene will talk about how to even start the conversation, because, of course, I bring up the fact that work environments can be very difficult for people of color. And, you know, because there's so much microaggression and so it now some of it could be personality, which I touch upon there as well. But some of it could be race. It could be racist. It could be prejudice. So we do need to work out better ways to bring these issues up within a work environment as well, so that you're not walking around suffering and re-traumatizing yourself. Because once you experience racism, it is a trauma. And Eugene is specialized in trauma as well. I mean, he started out working with people 
in adoption areas, you know, were fostered, adopted, and that alone is traumatic. So he's got a lot of experience in helping people in that way. And racism is a trauma. So every time you inflict upon someone else your racist views, thoughts, names, jokes, what's it, physical attacks, you are traumatizing someone. So you're hurting someone for life. This is something that people don't easily get over or through. And we've seen it again and again, certainly in my practice, even though people move on from it, they don't forget it and it can uh, come back in, in odd ways. I'm, I'm quite excited to start the conversation. Of course, this, isn't, this is the first on this podcast, but it won't be the last, of course. Um, and I, it's the right people that I want to speak with. It's got to be the right person. And Eugene is the right person with his experience. There is so much he offers. You know, go to his website. Some of the videos he has up and also he's got some series, you know, Black Men on the Couch. That's one of my favorites. And you've got to go to that resource. Now, of course, we're all we're, we're in the UK But that doesn't matter. Yes, and it will be different worldwide. You know, racism in another country can come across very differently. And I've certainly lived in different countries, as some of you know. So, so yes, so I can say that it may, you know, different people express it in different ways. And it can be less in some countries and more in others. So there is a conversation, a continual conversation. It's not that you have the one conversation. You've got to, you know, develop tools to continue to have the conversation and also not to be afraid to do so because that is sitting with and sitting on your own trauma, which could stick with you for life. Lastly, I'll just say before I play the interview here, is that, you know, some of you will be looking because, uh, you know, a family member said to me, you know, I never knew you had such diverse group of friends. Well, this relative, you know, hadn't seen, this relative hadn't seen certain parts of my life, of course. So they didn't see my everyday life is what you should say. So they didn't, they wouldn't have known. They knew about, you know, high school, uh, you know, I had, I was always in mixed diverse environments, always. And so, and also I come from a family whereby we were taught that racism is, is bad, (laughs) of course, from both areas. Let me just be clear. We were taught that black people should never, ever have that thought about they're better or worse than anybody else. So that, that would be racism splitting off uh, people because I think it's a psychological issue, but you know, I, I shall go on to that on another podcast at a different time. I've got my own views about the psychology of what happens when people are racist. And so I do have a vi- very diverse, and you will see even in my, yes, as somebody pointed out to me the other day, even in my guests, I started out interviewing people I know, and you'll see there that's very diverse, and also people I've known for 30 something years, and they're, you know, all diverse. So that's the background I have. That's the background I have. And I'm very, very grateful. It's the one part of me and my personality and my life that I am extremely proud of and very happy with and very pleased that I don't have those ideas and thoughts to deal with. Um, I, however, that doesn't stop them being imposed upon me. Uh, that doesn't stop me from you know, being attacked in a racist way, which I have been. I'll, t- I'll talk about all that another time. I've certainly had experience of racism. So, of course, you know, I, I have to say, of course, because if you're black, if you're a woman as well, it's going to happen. So there'll be different areas or different ways in which racist views are uh, imposed upon someone. And so... This conversation is very important today, and it won't be the last, as I said. And so I want to welcome Eugene Ellis to the podcast. Eugene, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So now, viewers, I'm going to be referring to my notes because there's so much here. You've heard in my introduction about what Eugene does, but 
you're an integrative arts psychotherapist, and I was really interested in your training and how you yeah. got into that. So because there's so many different modalities, what do you think drew you towards that particular training? I was a sort of sound engineer stroke musician in a previous life. Yes. And, uh, you know, that has its own challenges. And when you're young and, you know, meeting famous people and doing all of that is really, really great. But after a while, I just kind of wanted to move on and do something else. And I thought I could do maybe be a music therapist, something like that. And I was interested in therapy because I was, I spent a bit of time in therapy and um, I found it really, really helpful. And I tried to become a music therapist. And obviously you need to you need to have you know your scales, go through the, the system and uh, do a recital. So that wasn't really, that wasn't really me because I, di I didn't do that kind of stuff. Um, so I went to instead, um, so I found another course that was about the arts in general. And it didn't require you to do a recital, but it was more about, uh, in, in, you know the imagination metaphor and working in those in those kinds of ways so it was a talking therapy so it's kind of talking mainly talking uh, but the thing about talking is that we get ourselves caught up uh, in our own narratives about what we're talking about and we can convince ourselves in all kinds of ways about uh, um, about stuff that's going on um, or we just don't have the words so those, you know, those two things that people come in with when they sort of come into sort of therapeutic space. So uh, this modality really kind of invites people to be nonverbal about their um, about what's going on for them. So they might create something. Could just be a simple drawing, something in a sand tray. Um, maybe they bring their favorite song or something that evokes that sort of has a sort of sense of where they're at and then we can explore what they've created you know uh, what's this what's that um there's distance between this distance between that and it becomes a kind of an exploration so we've taken out what's in their head and, and put it on a piece of paper or something and then we're both looking at this thing and that can draw out some very interesting um yeah things for people they kind of you know they've, they've chosen one big figure and a little figure for them and a big figure for someone else you know that tells you and all of a sudden for them it's kind of like wow okay <laughs> um that tells a lot of it's a big story right there um and you know we need to let them tell their story their version of what they've created so it can create a kind of a way in to understanding yourself that's beyond words that it doesn't doesn't have to be word you know very wordy so that's what really appealed to me about it and that's kind of why I trained in that um in that particular way and of course I was I was a musician as well so music is you know playing music is all a part of that or playing music together um it's a person who's quite musical and seeing what creates. create yeah really interesting though because yeah. I often ask people do they believe that you're born with creativity or is it something that you learn or is it developed? And it appears that you've always had that draw towards some type of creativity. Would that be okay? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I like, um, I like playing with ideas and, you know, disparate things that don't seem to fit together. Yeah. Um, and finding a way for them to sort of coexist in, in the same place. And that can be quite a, and then something new gets created out of that. So that 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 kind of process, I really, I mean, enjoy isn't the right word. I get, you know, it's like it's it feels very transcendent. I feel alive, you know, when that that kind of happens. Yes. And the therapy space is, is a place for that, you know, as well. It's like when something happens for someone, and all of a sudden the world opens up in a in a very different way, and it's very exciting to to be to witness, you know. So I think I've always had that um so it's an interesting question about being born with it or not i think um i think people come with a certain um sort of movement towards that kind of place and then the world does does stuff to either support it or or, or um kind of bring it back um yes. it's probably a mixture of both i would say yeah interesting yes now yeah. did that then lead to barton the foundation that you created and can you tell us a little bit about that yeah, I I, did, I completed my training, 
And then I, uh, I sort of went into adoption. I've actually worked in adoption and I don't have much adoption stuff going on in my background. It was a, it was a place that um, worked with families and there was a sort of trauma theme there of the children coming into care. And there's something about just working with the whole family, which I which kind of attracted me rather than sort of the individual, although I do work with individuals as well. So that this this network coming together of disparate, again, some disparate sort of parts sometimes, disagreement with each other and kind of finding a way for, for things to work. Um, but anyway, and then, um, but I used to get loads of uh, requests for, you know, wh- you know whether I could see people, uh, people of color, um, and whether they knew, whether I knew of anyone, say, because I live in London, in, in Leicester or Birmingham or Scotland, or even the other side of London. And I, I didn't have an answer for people because I didn't know anyone. Uh, or I knew my own therapist, uh, who was a black man who lived the other side of London. So I traveled there. And I just thought, well, maybe there's a directory um, of ther- therapists of color who who practice and you know kind of want to tell people about their their practice and 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 I discovered there wasn't one um I thought there must be one in the United States surely there wasn't one there either so um and I just thought I don't know I don't know I don't know what kind of I don't know what came came to, I just had this energy to kind of create something so I got some funding and it was just a very simple web page um a directory web page where people could um list themselves as as being a therapist um just check their credentials and everything so they could go on um and that little that little list sort of started to grow 20 30 40 people um i thought oh that's all that's that must be most of the therapists in the uk <laughs> of color surely it can't be any more than that um because i basically i knew about four or five um and then I realized how isolated actually the therapists who were working um, were actually in their, wherever they were. And sometimes they were very close to get each other physically, but they weren't necessarily in contact directly with each other. Because generally speaking, then on their training, they might just be the only black person, the only Asian person, the only person of color on the course. So you kind of, you go through that process in, in isolation really. And then when the, when the list got to about a hundred or so, um, I think one person just said, oh, wow, there's a lot of us here. Why don't we meet? Oh, okay, that's, that sounds like a good idea. So I set up a meeting for everyone. That was our first conference. And then from there, it just became, um, it just had its own momentum, really. Uh, people just wanted to meet more. Um, the idea of supporting students came up quite strongly within the group because they're all qualified therapists. And then how do we do that? And then it was just little by little, we just did, um, student support groups and then we did mentoring and various other things so it sort of grew um it wasn't it wasn't sort of planned as a this is what I'm going to create <laughs> it just sort of it just sort of evolved over time and it's only more recently maybe over the last maybe five six seven years or so where I've kind of okay well let's just let's just make this thing a thing um and uh, certainly over the last two years, maybe two and a half years, I've been doing it exclusively to you know, of a, of a small client uh, group. But the, most of my time is spent uh, doing the network stuff. So yeah, so it's become it's become something that I hadn't really planned so much, but that was the sort of the the start of it. But what a wonderful resource and one that was really needed. Mm. Um, I know that when I was doing my training, my psychotherapy training, I was looking for a psychotherapist. I wanted a black psychotherapist. Um, I wanted to both. I wanted both experiences. Mm. I find one. Mm. This mm. was 25 years ago, but I couldn't find one. Mm. So I went, and then there were problems with some of the white psychotherapists. So, yeah, you know, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but then I found a therapist who was white, but mm. it worked out. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Still in touch. So, um, yeah, it is a resource that's needed. People feel intuitively, I believe, they know what they want. Yeah. They know what they wanted to see or deal with. And sometimes people see me and they, oh, a black psychotherapist. I mean, the number of times I've heard that and I'm thinking, what is that such an anomaly? 
So, mm. I mean, what would you say to maybe black men in particular? How would you encourage them to train as a psychotherapist? Because I still believe that my experience has been there's still a, a large mm. gap in that particular area. Yeah, I think um, yeah, men in general uh, think certainly when I was doing my training, I think well, I was one of four men, five men, you know, quite a large group of women. So I think it's there's there's that that's there's that aspect as well, isn't there? Yeah. And um but yeah, I think um I think there are a lot of black men actually who would who 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 would train and uh if they could <laughs> if they, you know it, when I say if they could, um if the conditions were if the conditions were right you oh. know i think it's a, i think it's about the the conditioning of the um of the places that people go to train and what to, and what are basic tenants and um you know what do they um privilege over other ways of being so i think the training space itself the ways that certainly um i've sort of seen them um sort of privilege a sort of a, perhaps a female way of being and also um a, a white way of being you know so it's kind of like um so for black men it's a diff it's a it's a difficult space um to um to sort of, sort of get into unless um, unless you've had some prior experience somewhere else in a particular context that kind of climatizes you to that kind of way of being um so yeah it's it's but um Certainly, I definitely. If you're in the UK and um, you want to train, or you're a black man or a black woman who want to train as a psychotherapist, I think one of the key issues really is having um, support, really, or having someone or, or a group of people at least that sort of you know you feel some affinity to, and who's doing who are going on the same journey. And um, we have a black men's group. A, th a therapy group here um and we allow people who are students uh into that space a uh, lot of the spaces we do are kind of they're, therefore qualified only or for students but the black men's space is different it's sort of anyone can come in um because i think for students um having that sort of very male um connection with others uh, is really really important because I think there's so many different ways of being a man, and it's 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 it is it's not straightforward on any level. Um, and a lot of men have a sort of a, a sort of feminine side to them, or a kind of a softer side to them, which, given the right conditions, can kind of flourish. And that, that's my experience. Um, and I spent a lot of time trying to hide that side of me, you know, but, and. Um, I, you know, I guess like a lot of people, if you let it out, what does it mean, you know? Um, and to see, to be with other men who are practicing in a particular way or letting that side out and, you know, the world hasn't ended. <laughs> There's no big drama. It's just, it's just another, another part of humanity coming out. Uh, and just to witness that in other people, you know, just gives them permission to, okay, well, I'll, I'll let mine out as well, you know, and and there is something really interesting about letting out that, because I think there's something about just holding in any aspect of you. You're actually reining in everything, you know. <laughs> it's not like oh, I can just take this bit and stick it away, and the other bit just like you know flourishes. There's something about just letting it all kind of come out, um, and actually the, the 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 masculine elements kind of come out in their full glory too, you know. So it's kind of a it's a full sort of flowering and i think that's really uh for me that's been my experience uh the much you know the more i've allowed that sort of softer side to come out and i'm using the word soft but I, it's not that it's not softer i mean maybe there's some other maybe feminine perhaps but, but it's not so much in doesn't it's a sort of a um a sort of an idea of mm -hmm. femininity rather than being a female but that you know letting that sort of side out letting it be kind of heard and witnessed and seen um you know just is is it's quite liberating it's quite liberating on, on lots of different fronts and uh yeah so you know um so it's only encouraging men but i think that i think it does need it feels like it needs to be done within a 
within a group context of men who was you know who was um on a similar path um and then something something and something had happened in that space yes so yeah finding those spaces i think is is um job number one i think absolutely but yeah. your bhatan is a place to start so yeah. you know, the links will all be in the show notes guys i would encourage you to go and have a look at the website as well but yes um men i think my practice is probably half and half half men half women you know and it changes sometimes i'll get lots of men all at once coming for therapy i think mm. it changes um mm. But the number of black men, uh, percentage-wise, I know I looked at these percentages years ago. I can't remember. It's low. It's probably one percent. Right. Okay. To therapy, yes. More, you know, more white men. I see. Right. Right. But I do see a lot of men come to therapy, mm. which, is good, which is good, I believe. Yeah, I say it's slightly different for me. Yeah, I've got more men of color mm. than, than other than other groups but i guess i guess there's a reason for that <laughs> um, you know being a man as well but um and uh they don't get very many white men um there, there have been a few but uh yeah not not many that's very interesting i haven't really sort of content, thought about that before but yeah that's kind of how it is yeah, yeah. well I, I was curious as to why i was just getting all white people and um and i looked and thought but I don't know. It's an interesting bit, but it did make me sort of wonder about that. And I wondered about the cost as well, because psychotherapy mm -hmm. training is expensive. It's as much as a, you know, a master's degree. And I wondered if that played a part in people not wanting to to train. Um, yeah. What do you think? Um, I think so. I think I think there's a certain percentage who 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 just wouldn't be able to right. to to sort of manage the cost, or 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 they might be able to manage the cost, but it's kind of a, it's a sort of consuming kind of element of the whole process. Um, but there's also many who who can as well, um, who who for whatever reason choose not to because it's got a particular um uh yeah because it because, because of what it is um and also the the environment that they feel that they might be stepping into would not be one that's they want to pay for you know um so you know there, it is a lot of money and um and you know when you step into it you know you want your money's worth don't you at least and yes that's not often the feeling you get <laughs> as a person of color getting into the training so it, it, it can there's a lot of stuff going on there about money yes um and value for money and all sorts of stuff but yeah there's definitely a huge you know huge group where money is a big issue there have been a few places that have offered bursaries but they're very 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 limited very limited yeah. absolutely and even on the nhs my working mm -hmm. experience on the nhs there weren't many black well, I only met one uh, black consultant psychiatrist during my work as a group therapist. Mm -hmm. And when I joined, uh, the black consultant psychiatrist had just retired. Right. Yeah. Um, but then there wasn't anyone else. So I thought, mm -hmm. wow, that's that's interesting. So underrepresented, even me as a therapist there was, you know, I was the only black person. Mm -hmm. So, so there needs to be perhaps more awareness. I, I'm not sure, but it's certainly something to look into. Sure, yeah. But I, I just want to touch upon the work environment while we're talking about that. My experience has been people find it difficult to talk about race. And uh, we're going to talk about your book in a moment about conversations with race. And I don't know if it's because they do lack the language, some people. Some people perhaps could be frightened, afraid to bring it up in a work environment. They may feel as though they're not listened to. There could be various reasons, but mm -hmm. I wondered in your experience of working with people, because I would guess that you see people from all walks of life who are mm -hmm. corporate and maybe not self-employed, all of that. Why do you think people find it a challenge? I'll use that word for lack of a better mm -hmm. perhaps, uh, to talk, 
about race, to open up the conversation about race, or even express their thoughts about race. I mean, I, I mean the um, a lot of training that I was doing, especially around uh, adoption, was tr sort of trauma focused. So working with trauma, and um, certainly in that field, you really get to see trauma at work. You know, sometimes we just sort of kind of use this word and throw it around: trauma, trauma. This you know, that person traumatized or whatever. And um, uh, you know, that's one level of trauma. They might be in, a, in an accident or something's happened to them, and they kind of you know feeling the effects of a quite a big experience that they've had but um this idea of kind of relational trauma which is kind of where you know where actually the trauma happens in, in relationship when you're you know really developing as a human being um as that's that's what happens in adoption you kind of get to see this flowering of, of trauma in, in a particular way um and it sort of goes beyond words really um even words, you know, even words themselves can sometimes trigger trauma um, within these families that uh, I'm working with. So you, you don't have to sort of fall back on your body and um, and sort of manage manage the situation in a very very different way. And I think that's the same for these conversations around race. Um, there's something there's something in relationship between black people um white people um and then and, and the generational past and the sort of reenactment of something that's gone on for, for many you know, hundreds and hundreds of years which kind of just sort of which we can kind of just keep out of our minds you know and just get on with our lives and have you know friendly conversations with people but as soon as we as soon as we start, start to focus on that social you know, social construct of race um, all of a sudden, all of that history just sort of comes in, and it's going, you know, and and people feel people feel this rush of something, um, and they often can't explain it because it's sort of like it's just you know they don't really think about the generational con you know, context of this. All they know is they've got these feelings, um, and then they try to attribute those feelings to something that's going on. So maybe maybe they're stupid, or maybe. <laughs> Or you know, or maybe they uh, they just don't get things right in this area, you know. So it, and then they start to self attribute um, what was what's going on, and and what it is is a kind of a generational trauma that's being played out in the moment, um, and it's 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 hard to overcome that unless you unless you figure out a way to kind of come to terms with the history. Of course, there's always a denial about history, isn't there? So well, ah, we don't need to talk about that. That was hundreds of years ago you know what i mean uh and it just gets in the way anyway it just complicates matters the more you know the more we dig in there it's just a waste of time so that's people's general sense of that and maybe they all they need to do is just work it out in the moment you know i'm a good i'm a good person um i want the best for people i want the world to be a better place um and that and, and that's enough i think that people feel that that's enough but it, it's it's way it's not enough at all um and then at some point I think, think people who make a decision to investigate their own racial identity, to maybe look at the history of their own their own racial identity going back, and uh, other racial identities, and really sort of take in the sort of full scope of what's going on, and, and make a decision to step into that place. Because even if you're a person of color, you still have to make the decision to step into it. You know. <laughs> You don't get any special license to sort of walk into that space because you've just got a black face and a white person, you know, doesn't have to do it or whatever. Um, you know, you too can just step back and not step in there. And um, and for you, it will be difficult conversation to have. So to some extent, your racial identity, um, obviously, obviously, if it's a certain racial identity, it's probably more, you have more chance of stepping in there because you kind of feel compelled to, you have to, because... You know your your whole life is kind of wrapped up in all of this in a particular way um but that's no guarantee you're going to do it at all um and so once you make that decision and you take some time and you kind of really spend some time in that place um the conversation is always going to be hard um and if you did make that decision to spend some time in this area the, the conversation will be easier um less intense 
but um, it will still be intense. <laughs> but what you'll be working with is this kind of in the moment thing a little bit more and less about the you know that whoosh of energy that comes from this sort of generational kind of history that we all share. So the, that you know the conversation is so loaded with stuff, isn't it? And without examination, we're all lost. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. You could be the you know the most cleverest thinker in the world, very brainy. Uh, put you know uh, in other areas you can put things together and really kind of yeah yeah I've got this. And then as soon as it comes to race, it's like the whole thing's whole thing falls apart. Um, and it's hard. Um, yeah, and so that you know, and, and we're not really given any any license, any tools, anything really, are we, to to step into that place? And we're actively encouraged not to. Um, Good point. You know, uh, everything about our lives is kind of geared up to not going there, not attending to this hurt, not attending to the pain, not attending to anything around that. So there's a lot to overcome um, to step into a and step into a place where you feel, okay, I got this, you know, I got this. Um, and you're often going against the going against the grain of society, really, aren't you? So there's quite a, this kind of uphill struggle. So yeah, so I mean that's quite a long, <laughs> a long explanation, but it's sort of um, I mean that's what we're working with, we're working at all of that uh history, generational history, and it's very powerful and it just overrides everything about um who we think we are um our cognitive strengths yeah. um, you know is the cognition that that's the first thing to go um and uh and once that goes i mean you know what else is there you know just the feelings isn't there left and the and the body responses that people have and they, and people want to get away from that as quickly as possible yeah so the silence, the tumbleweeds, that sort of <laughs> that moment where, you know, everyone, you know, I'm sure everyone who's listening can kind of identify with that kind of moment where the race conversation comes in and then something gets frozen and stopped in time almost. And wow. everyone's desperate to move on and get onto something else. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. If you're enjoying the show so far, here's your chance to subscribe and support the channel. Hit that like button and also, very importantly, leave me a comment wherever you are listening or watching. Even if you just put an emoji, it lets us know that you're with us. Here's your countdown. Thanks for your support. Now back to the show. People twitch. They, they. If you watch their body language, I mean, there's so much there. I, yeah. And That's I like what you were saying about so people may feel as though they don't have it, that they may be stupid or, or, or whatever it is, that mm. they're having these reactions. Mm. Uh, my experience has been that people sometimes dumb down their own experiences of being discriminated against. Yeah, I, I don't know why. I haven't delved into it enough. But you know, they'll say things like, "Oh, it wasn't that bad," or mm. and you listen to their trauma, and whew, that was mm. that was tough. So I'm I'm not quite sure if it's a defense, if it's a way to protect, um, and maybe some more research could be done. There you go, guys out there on your psychotherapy course, on your masters. There's a research project for you. <laughs> um, you know, maybe there's research that needs. Um, to be done. I mean, my, I mean, I think it's only when you, when you start to really dig into the dig into all the stuff around the past and the history and how we got here. Yeah. You're going to have to abandon the version of the world you had before, um, and then the world becomes a kind of like a uh you know when, when you sort of look out into the world it, 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 it's a different world you know um so it's a hot it's a uh, a more cruel world a more sort of heartless world kind of you know intense world that you that you didn't you know and no one wants to live in that world you know they'd rather just live in the world that they had before digging into that stuff so i think people instinctively know that that's where they're heading or they have a sense of going there 
And so it's kind of natural just to dial down, isn't it? Your 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 responses to it all, you know, because I'd just rather live in this this world. This world's much better. Um, you know, I think you know, and it, and it, and it is it is a big shock to 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 reveal, you know, to lift the veil and see what's going on. It's like it is it, it's a sort of you almost have to recalibrate recalibrate your yeah, um, yeah. what the world is about almost yeah. in, in a quite a big way. So it's kind of yeah, that, that's my take on it. But I'm sure there's many different kind of ways of looking at that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But that that brings me to maybe just some signs that you may be that there may be something afoot as such. Mm. Um, you know, I things like. I suppose in a work environment, in a family environment, uh, where there may be a mixture of races, because that's mm -hmm. very common now, mm -hmm. um, and that's something that comes into psychotherapy as well a lot uh, in our world. I don't know if you found that, but certainly, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder things like sort of not being promoted at work, being held back, uh, clear opportunities m not being made. Um, uh, over sexualized language towards you if you're a black female or black male perhaps your mm. your colleagues may be talking to you in a particular way mm. um things like uh being talked about gossiped about uh now some of that may not be race some of it may be personality but yeah. some of it may be race so what what are other signs that people may look at that maybe a conversation needs to be had now I mean, that's the line, isn't it? That's really maybe in the UK, there's sort of slight differences and perhaps in the US where perhaps people feel more licensed in the cultural sense to kind of just sort of say it as it is, you know, in the UK, it's more muted responses and stuff. So it's, it's difficult to, to test the test the line. Um, yeah. But I think, if, I think if, if there's a sort of measure of discomfort that you're feeling, yeah. then there's something. You know, I think your body will tell you that something's not right. Excellent. Yes. Um, but what you do about it then is another story, isn't it? Because then you could, uh, most people sort of have that initial experience and then 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 throw doubt on it. They kind of say, "Oh, maybe it's this, or maybe it's that, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's that." Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, um, sometimes they're having conversations with with people who just want to maybe have a conversation about what's going on in their training course or in their workplace or whatever, and they're sort of talking, talking, talking about it. They haven't used the word racism yet, but they're talking about it, and there's this white person, there's this black person, and so all the signs are there in the conversation. Um, and then at some point I might say, I mean, have you ever considered that it might there may be a racial element to this? And it's almost like, they need to hear it from someone else to confirm that it, that it is what it is, you know. And they say, yes, 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 actually, I think I do. Um, and they could have said that half an hour ago, but it somehow it wouldn't have. I think there's something about getting to that place. Um, because the line is, is uh, or, or confirming the body and, the, and what's going on. Um, and then what you can do about it, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different responses, isn't there? Because it depends on, on your... I mean, there's first of all, it's like confirming this is what it is. And then there's the response and also the resources um, that you have or don't have. That's a good um, point about resources. And um, if you obviously, if you, if you feel resourced, yeah, go in there, talk to the manager, have this conversation. This is what I think it is. Um, and these are the reasons why. Um, and if you feel, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're backed up, if you feel backed up by by the collective or it might just be another person um uh then that's one thing but if you don't necessarily feel resourced um uh you know there could be you know if, if there's going to be any sort of fallout it, you know it's the black person is going to get the sharp end of the stick normally isn't it so you know there is a kind of a there is a sort of uh, a weighing up of resources i guess that needs to be done at that point um and it's always preferable to go in there and find your voice in that way but there may be other and there's this process of finding your voice so you might express your voice in the in the situation the manager the other person the tutor but there's other ways of expressing your voice that not necessarily directly yeah. a person but still has a kind of a healing component to it so you're looking after yourself here 
this sort of self-care um you know and then it, there's all these options isn't there changing the system and there's a sort of system changing by going in there telling them how it is hopefully that will change the system or taking care of yourself there's all these <laughs> and then there's resources so i think all that needs to be weighed up and if um um and a lot of people are can you know um quite rightly are sort of focused on on change um and you know and pay the price because of the resources that are there to to meet the the challenges that sort of come back so i think there is a there is a balance to be made there um and i would err on the on the side of self-care there's no point in you know racism is about um sort of has this has this has this sort of traumatic impact on people so um I'm certainly my, from my point of view, I'd want to lessen that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if people have resources, then they could go into go into a situation and not necessarily be traumatized by it, and then do something something positive around it. So that that's the ideal. Yeah. But of course, there's there's a whole range of options um, uh, aside from that, and maybe suggesting to people that actually, if they do nothing, that's an option. It's not a you know, you haven't failed. There's no obligation, to, you know, in terms of your community to do to do this. Um, I think you have an obligation to look after yourself in terms of your community. I think that's that's. I would say that, <laughs> um, so that you're okay. I think I think people in your community will definitely support that. Um, so yeah. So again, there's lots of lots of options there, isn't there? Um, rather than there's one single response. So I think that is, um, well, that's just not possible. It's just not. It's not realistic, as you know, as as a as an option anyway. So, yeah. um, but that is often the way that it's sort of portrayed, isn't it? That you you need to do this because, and and you feel pressured mm -hmm. because you don't have the resources to do it. You've got no idea what's going to happen. You feel terrified, um, and. Um, and that can be, you know, that sort of, you know, I guess that's the race, you know, it's the race construct at work, isn't it? Again, just sort of bringing down this individual, you know, sort of yeah. weighing them down with stuff. Um, and no, 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 we need to, if, if, if possible, stay away from that kind of uh, way of uh, being. It's difficult. Very difficult. Difficult, though. Absolutely. As you say, they may not have the resources. But they could also maybe go into counselling. So this is where your organisation, Bartan, come in, because yeah. it may be that you need to talk it through with someone who can yeah. see your side and who will be on, naturally be on your side as a therapist. Yeah. Maybe that you want to go through it first to, to work out and look at options, strategies you can oh. use. It may not be, as you were saying, that you've got to do something straight away. Mm. And as you very succinctly put it, self care is the number one yes yeah. so going into therapy is a part of self-care and it may be that you yeah. can seek some extra help um, yeah no i agree i think i think it's um i i, I view it as a, a, a quite a radical act actually mm -hmm. that self-care thing mm -hmm. quite a radical thing to do <laughs> um it, it it takes a lot out of you um in a particular way yeah. but it also gives you quite a lot back as well which maybe other radical things don't do quite so much they sort of just take 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 <laughs> and there's nothing left um but yeah and and uh you're going you know this idea of finding your voice which is, i think is a really interesting just idea yeah. um because i mean some, you know something's coming at you and then there's this kind of response that to to act and then you're kind of prevented from acting so the energy just sort of stays in there yeah um and um you know this idea of finding your voice can be a way of just sort of getting the you know, putting the energy back out there mm. and um and, and and you know through a sort of seeing a therapist having a sort of therapy journey can be a way of kind of finding your voice in some way and it um it, it might be within the confines of this uh, this relationship that you have with the therapist but eventually you'll find its way out of that 
you know, once you can do it there, you can do it out there. And this is like, a, like almost like a testing ground. Um, and it's very empowering, you know, to find, to, to, to find your voice in, in some way. Um, again, it doesn't mean banging down the doors and, uh, um, seeking sort of behavior change, um, from white people, but that's a big part of it, of course, but there's also a part of it about just, uh, uh, in terms of your own mental health, you know, just being able to kind of communicate your experience. Um, it's good for you and it might do some change <laughs> and the, the hope is that it will, um, but yeah, they're sort of, um, I think the therapy process is really, um, obviously with the right person, um, is a good way of kind of coming, coming to some relationship with your own racial identity in a particular way that's going to be helpful for you. Yeah, good point. So I want to talk about your book. First of all, congratulations on your new book. This is The Race Conversation, uh, An Essential Guide to Creating Life-Changing Dialogue. So... I was reading some of it, and mm -hmm. you've got some very good quotes in it as well, um, especially about systemic racism or uh, mm -hmm. structural racism as such. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the book. What led you to write this? Because there's some real good bits in there about how to start this conversation about race. Um, um, as you can imagine, in Barton, there's a lot of conversations around race, and we're all therapists, so we all try our best to sort of uh, keep them as constructive as we can. And um, but even then, there's there's a lot going on, um, even with these professionals who are supposed to be able to, you know, dig into the psyche and get to the get to the kernel of truth uh, and all of this stuff that we're swimming in. But it was equally hard for therapists as it is for for any, for anyone else. It seemed. Um, and I'm just obs I'm just observing the the kinds of things that used to happen between people in terms of getting the conversation, even thinking about the conversation itself. So not not just the conversation, but even thinking about it was difficult. Um, and there'd be these um, so there'd be many instances where we'd sort of set something up where we're going to be talking about you know um, racism in training or something you know whatever we'll, we'll be talking about. There'd be a lot of conversation about set, setting up the space in a safe way. And that was most of the conversation. How can it be safe? Is people is those people's first kind of like, how can I feel safe? Um, and I thought, well, there's no one, there's no one in this room, we're all colleagues. There's no one's gonna, there's not gonna be no one with a gun or anything gonna shoot people. There's no, you know, there's not there's, in a way there's nothing to be scared of um but then there was this sort of sense of danger uh, maybe even of life threat you know somewhere in the air and if that could be brought down a few notches then we can start to have the conversation so that that's what people were kind of saying quite a lot and the question was well so that starts so i started to think about not necessarily the conversation itself and you know, what you say in this situation or how to manage this situation or that kind of thing um i just i just i i kind of took the stance that actually most people can problem solve relationship difficulties quite well in other areas and really really skilled at it you know you don't have to be a therapist either to be good at it either you could just be naturally good yeah. um but then, and then there's something blocking that ability when it comes to this particular topic so that's kind of where i started so i became very interested in um yeah just that whole you know the, the the energy in the body and what and you know that became my main focus how to how to, you know before the conversation what can we do to prepare ourselves for the conversation and so the so the ideas of the book began to um sort of come out based on the sort of trauma the trauma theories and various trauma theories that i'd been feel quite lucky to have been where I was working with quite, it, it felt like at the, at the edge of this trauma um, revolution thing that we're talking about, neuroscience. So there's loads of lectures, breaking new theories and all this kind of stuff. So you know, I felt like on the on the leading wave of all of that. Um, and, all, and a lot of that information about how the body functions, um, when we're under stress, what does the nervous system do, how does it work? 
um, nervous systems communicating to other nervous systems, you know, danger, safety, life threat, just those simple kind of ideas um, became kind of interesting, <laughs> very interesting. So I thought I'd write a book about it and to prepare, basically the book is about preparing your nervous system almost really to get to go into this space. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, the limbic brain, all of that stuff, you know, mm. about stress and our responses. Excellent. Mm. So when people get this book, uh, and there'll be a link to it in the show notes, guys, uh, to the Amazon link, but I'm sure you can get it other places. It's probably the easiest link. Oh, yeah. your website as well, can't they, I think? Uh, yeah, yeah, my website, yeah, it's there. Um, and there's a link to the, um, actually, there is a code. Oh, excellent. Twenty um, percent off until the th I don't know when this goes out, but um I can I can get another code if it's not uh perfect. That would be great. Depending on timing. And so if they go to uh, to Kar Karnak, which is the publishers, then they yeah. can get the twenty percent off, which is cheaper than Amazon. Excellent. I will put the link. The link is there, guys. <laughs> so have a look. Wonderful. So when people read the book, what will they take away from it? They'll learn conversations, how to start it, but also become more aware of their body responses um, and what's happening in their brain. We're looking at mm. history that they may be unconscious about or mm. conscious about, uh, because sometimes parents can say things, you're, you're two. And my experience has been that stays in there. So mm. somehow these memories, our body responses, uh, remain with us. That's my belief, my experience anyway. I yeah. think he has different thoughts about this. But is that what they'll take away from it? Yeah, I think I think they'll sort of take away that it's possible to move from it being very difficult to it being manageable. Yes. So that's the first thing they're going to take away. Um, I mean, I've done a lot of reading as part of this book and a lot of what I what a lot of what I read didn't really um it was a lot of good information um but you know I like I like things that sort of lead me into 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 the next action you know yeah. <laughs> um if, if I if I learn something is that okay it's great I've learned this thing because they're all concepts anyway aren't they they're just kind of ideas basically but does this idea allow me to take the next step even if I choose not to take it, at least I know what the next step is. Right. I never really got a sense of that with reading other books about, I mean, there's a lot of information, but then what do you do with it? You know, what do you, you know, how, how, how do you manage it? And it, there's um, even books that had a lot of information about stuff and then a little section at the end about how you might kind of resolve some of these issues. And but, you know, that was very light, often it was just like a passing sort of a, maybe a couple of pages at the end to kind of say, oh, if you did this, then you might be able to overcome. So I thought I'd make that section a bit bigger. <laughs> um, and actually the whole book is in fact um, about that, about sort of moving beyond where you are. So you have to, well, you don't have to, but you have to buy into this idea of trauma anyway. So, and again, these are all concepts and ideas. So whether they're true or not, for me is slightly academic you know if you start to scratch away and say oh, that's not true the question is does it help me to to get to where i want to get to and if it, and if, it, if i get to where i want to get to i can just throw that theory away and maybe get another one to get to go to the next stop so i think theory is a good the trauma theory is a good kind of idea that helps us to um do something positive um about our experience of the world how we experience the world so i decided to sort of use that those ideas so you can so you will, you will take away the basic ideas of trauma and what it what it's about um you also take away this idea that you can't just um you can't just not attend to the history um you know if, even if you walk into a gp surgery or doctors you know they all know what's going on don't they they you know they say oh my leg's hurting me um and then they treat it uh, they they want to know what's going on so they take a history of what's happening there may even be a genetic history that they're interested in you know does your parents have diabetes blah blah blah, blah. and then they can so the history is really important um so there's there's not a lot of history but there's enough 
to give you a sense, a broad sense, certainly in the UK context, of um, what we're working with. Um, and then um, and then there's some ideas um, to kind of orientate us in the space that we're in. There, um, there's no big surprises um, in the race conversation. So there's no big revelations that one individual is going to discover. <laughs> it hasn't happened before. <laughs> So it's all very um it's all very predictable but of course people don't really f experience it that way they experience it as chaotic not quite knowing what's going on but actually the language of race the way that people respond and all that stuff is very very predictable it's not really chaotic at all so if people have a sense of the the, the fixedness of it and where things tend to go and what tends to happen um they might feel a bit more secure in it um, and it's not random. It's not like it's not like it's not like that at all. You know, it's, it's very, very, very predictable. And, I, and sometimes I just sort of sit and watch um, in a group context, and we're talking about race, and I'm just sort of watching the whole thing play out in a quite a detached way. I mean, I don't know whether it sort of feels a little bit strange in some way, but I say, oh, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, 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 there's no big surprises there when when things are going on. And I think that's important to have a sense that, you know, it's like, oh, boy, we've, been, we've been here before. Um, and uh, you can sort of step away from it a little bit. Mm -hmm. so then it's not it's not about you, particularly. Um, obviously, you're in there. Yeah. Um, but it's not you. This is a collective thing that we're all playing around. And that can just allow you to step up, step up, step up, step away a little bit, see it slightly differently. And that shift in perspective is everything, you know, it's, it's, really, it's everything, really. Um, so the book is hopefully going to shift the perspective a little bit. So when you look, you know, when you look at the world, you sort of see it differently. And if you see it differently, you will respond differently. I mean, that's just how it is. <laughs> that, that's just that's just basic um, psychology. Um, so that's what the book is trying to um, try to do is sort of orientate people. Um, in a particular way and and also um i wanted to make it readable um so that people don't feel because it is trauma and you need to respect the people's bodies and nervous systems and, and, and i remember reading stuff and just being really kind of like really triggered into you know all kinds of states and i thought was well, that is that really good for me i mean i don't know <laughs> um I think you do need you do need a bit of like, something to kind of get you know you need a bit of bite you know you can't just sort of um treat this um, subjects very lightly and kind of tread too lightly so you do need to sort of push but you also need to step back um and that kind of idea of just sort of moving in moving out moving in moving out moving in that kind of this is what trauma is trauma therapy is about it's just so gently nudging in there, pulling back into safety, a bit more danger, safety. And that can kind of, that movement is built in, hopefully, in the book. So people feel like at least their nervous systems aren't under attack. Mm -hmm. It's under pressure, but um, um, but it's not under attack. And, and I think that, that can allow the information to come in in a slightly different way. So there was quite a lot, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of care taken to kind of manage the responses that people readers would have to the content um and there's invitations to pause and to reflect mm -hmm. on uh, on your body and what's going on oh that was really yeah good. yeah mm -hmm. so that was a sort of basic idea to kind of treat treat the reader as a client almost yeah so, yeah. It, it is easy to follow. It's easy flow. So, and also, I would encourage all people to read this book. This is not just for black people. This, no, no, no. no. I, yeah, I, I, I would suggest if you aren't a person of color, you should be reading this book without yeah. a doubt because it will help you to become a bit more comfortable in discussing this with people of color. Yeah. Um, but it is a good read, I have to say. I'm not just saying it because you're on the show. <laughs> Thank you. And also, I think you get a perspective from a psychotherapist. You know, that does, you've got somebody who's who knows, you know, the science, but also who has experience of working with people who brought these cases in. 
Mm. Um, and so this isn't just, you know, although you mentioned a bit about your, which I thought was very helpful at the beginning, a little bit about your personal experience. That's really good. Mm. Uh, but it does bring in that aspect as well. I think it hits all areas there. So, exactly. yeah, great stuff. Glad you've written it. We needed it. And uh, there's a link with a code <laughs> below, guys. So uh, have a look. But I wanted to ask you, is there any other skill that you have besides therapy? Because you had a short stint in music where you actually were a chief engineer for one of the UK's most loved and amazing groups, Soul to Soul. Mm. Um, so you're obviously musical, but any other, you know, skills? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm actually... Um... I'm very good. I mean, it, 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 people that go to the website, uh, Barton website, yeah. and I go there, whoa, this is like, it's, there's a lot of stuff here. How much have they paid for this website? Um, but their website's been done by me. So I, I do, uh, so I have that, so I do have that kind of technical skill. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably more of kind of like trial and error because you know, there's loads of new tools nowadays, yeah. but you do need to spend time doing it. And I do, um, and even the first web, even the first directory I, I, I put on. And back in those days, you had to code, you had to code in HTML and all that kind of stuff. So it was a little, it was a little harder back, back then. But, um, but yeah, it sort of gave, it sort of, um, so that, that is a skill I actually have, which I quite like. I quite enjoy doing that kind of thing, that sort of very creative visual, uh, visual stuff. Um, so, um, so we hadn't had to pay big money for, for that. It's a lot of money, that isn't it? Yo, it's huge. It's <laughs> amazing. I mean, I always say just those four letters, HTML, sends me into a trauma state. So, <laughs> you know, the fact that you can do that, that's brilliant. <laughs> ah, okay. So you're still, you're musical. Uh, any particular genres? Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I used to, um, I used to be this, well, when I finished the sound engineering, I was in this production company called Peace Productions. Um, and uh, we did remixes um, of other people's tunes, you know, back in the day, that's how it was, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I did have designs on sort of being a singer and uh, I made an album. <laughs> and, uh, um, I kind of went through the whole whole thing, but it- um, That's not on the website, but anyway. That's not on the website. That's not on the website, but it's, um, I think, yeah, I just, I, I, something happened. I just couldn't, I couldn't sort of follow it through. I think it was just nerves and belief, <laughs> self-belief. Um, I think I needed, to, maybe if I was doing it now, I might be more, um, kind of more willing just to kind of let it out there. But um, yeah, so I've still got a lot of, a lot of. Um, I've got some guitars here and stuff. And I don't spend enough time doing it. I always say, oh, I'm going to spend. You know, I've got Thursdays. And I'm going to do it on spend it on doing music, and I made my that little promise to myself. And um, um. And you know the sound engineering part of it is fine, uh, and the music, you know, to some extent is fine. But it just um, just hasn't happened. There's been so many other things coming into that space, and, and I think that's the uh, a lot of people will probably uh, uh, empathise with that position <laughs> of being, you know, uh, in the music earlier or playing the instruments and then trying to do it when you're a little bit older in the same kind of way and. It failing, <laughs> failing dramatically. <laughs> but that ability um, yeah. never goes away, though. I don't no, know. I think I'm just being. I mean, I'm being creative in different ways, and yes. certainly through the book and through writing. Actually, Absolutely. I never thought I could be creative in that in that in that way in that place. It's like, um, and it's a very very interesting writing. You know, just writing itself. Mm. Um, I've had this kind of very yeah, choppy relationship with it, and um, from school and and all that, you know, just being at school and the the, the linear thinking mm -hmm. of the school process, you know, um, and you know, doing essays and all that stuff. So it's always been difficult. Then more recently, I found out that actually there was a reason for that because I was dis I was dyslexic. Oh, so that that kind of put things into perspective a little bit more, and I've got some tools. Um, on my computer, I've got this MacBook Pro here with loads of little things on it to help me. Um, and if it comes to speaking, everything's fine. Um, when it comes to bringing it into, into words, it's kind of fine. Yeah. 
and and uh, if it's just like a sentence or two but once it starts getting into long form it starts to sort of lose its coherence um so but yeah you know speaking in speaking speaking it has kind of really worked and it's kind of been a really yeah um yeah really interesting journey, creative journey actually writing uh I've come to I actually quite like it now it used to be horrible I hated it <laughs> oh that means <laughs> you hated it. Book, I think maybe yeah good good we're gonna get another book then oh um yes we are good yeah, yeah. okay Brilliant. <laughs> we'll keep an eye out for it. And I hope you'll come yeah. back and talk about that when it when it so, comes back as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So just um oh speaking of speaking, you had a podcast as well. So what's happening with that? Is that still uh I saw a podcast. Is that still going? Is it still um it's still available. I mean um I really enjoyed doing the podcast, um, interviewing people. And um, because I'm a sound engineer, I just put put the whole thing yes. together. And it's fine. It was like fairly straightforward, but I just don't get time. Okay. Yeah, and it's always like it's on my list. <laughs> Restart the podcast, and um, it takes a while, as you know. To um, yes. I mean, the interviewing bit is fine. It's the editing bit afterwards, isn't it? And all that takes a little while. <laughs> so uh, there hasn't been the time. Yeah. Okay. Now, I want to talk about the Barton Mentoring Project. And we talked about it a little bit before, um, but what do people need to do if they want to get on the project? Um, so they need to be, uh, or thinking at least, of going on to a, uh, a counselling course or a psychotherapy right. course. So they need to be a student. Yeah. All they really need to do is just go to the Barton website. Uh, there's a mentoring section. Perfect. And, um, and sign up. I mean, um, it's, I think it's £35 to be a student member. So it's, it's pretty good value. You get a lot for, you, you get a lot for, your, member, for your membership. Um, so there are student groups you can attend and various occasional student sort of seminars about um, writing dissertations and things like that. And then there's a one-to-one a -one mentoring project. So if you sign up to that, um, it uh, then there's an op opportunity to sort of get at, um, an individual person who, you know, if you want a, a male or a female or someone who's trained in a particular modality, so someone who's actually done the training already um, can kind of you know meet up and they can guide you through um, some of the pitfalls um, that uh, people might have. So the idea is to kind of get people because I think there's been there hasn't been any studies about this, but um, Anecdotally, it's there's, a, there's a quite a high dropout rate. Black students, yeah. Asian students on psychotherapy courses, they sort of start and then they don't end. So the mentoring project really is to kind of support them all the way through to the end, so that they can, you know, uh, work um, uh, in the business. So, so yeah, so people can just go to the website, and hopefully the link is fairly straightforward to to get to in terms of the mentoring project. Such a great resource, really. Yeah. And you know, one of the things I was so impressed about was the black men on the couch, mm. and I was particularly taken with Kwame's um, interview. Uh, but are you going to be doing more of those? Um, I know you were working with other people on that, or there were mm. other people involved. Will there be more? It will be more. I've just heard um, Rotomi Akinshete, who's um, really masterminding all of those. He's been doing them over a few years um he's uh yeah he, uh, he just contacted me the other day to sort of say yeah he needs to kind of grab up the engine again so th there will be more um and uh you know they'll, they'll be posted uh on the website as, as normal and, and they're, they're, they're being fantastic um resources uh for people and um just to sort of know that they're happening um so yeah there'll definitely be more there's nothing like that. There's nothing else out there like it. So it's such a unique and it's a, um, oh gosh, I've lost the word. What do you call it? Niche. Niche, <laughs> yes, yes. It's niche. Yeah, it, it's very particular. So I'm going to put links to all that because there just isn't anything like that out there. So this is brilliant stuff. <laughs> Eugene, thank you so much for joining me today. Is there anything else you want to add? I'll have all the links there, but anything coming up that we need to look out for? Oh, I'm um, it's going to be a counselling course we're doing. 
Mm. Excellent. Yes. Tell us about that. You better say something about that. Um, so at the moment, we're looking for tutors. So th the idea of this course is going to be um, sort of like a, a beginner's course. Mm -hmm. And it'd be sort of basic counselling skills. So it'd be listening skills and sort of the basics in terms of just being a counsellor. Um, but um, I was interested in kind of having a sort of a space, an introduction course that was like a preparation for training um, on another, on a kind of more established course. Yeah. The Wild West, as I like to call it, you know, it's because it's uh, a lot of choices. Um, and, um, you know, I sometimes find it hard to recommend, you know, people say, oh, which course can I do? Which one's going to be the best person? I'm a black man, and you know. And I, and I can't really honestly say go here or go there. It's just not, <laughs> um, just haven't got, you know, they haven't got to that place yet um, for me to make that kind of recommendation. But what we can do is kind of prepare people for for the journey that they might have. Um, so, yeah, so we're starting a course, hopefully that will start in September. Um, and uh, hopefully it will be reasonably priced. Um, and we're really thinking about all aspects of a, of a training course and we've been thinking about it for a year and a half about the various things obviously um the focus the most you know most people on the course will be people of color um so it's going to have a particular feel and shape people will be really interested in digging into yeah. identity racial identity intersections of other identities um so yeah just we just kind of you know, there's a lot to think about <laughs> in that kind of space um uh so yeah so that'll be that's so hopefully that'll be um off the ground and we're looking for some uh, tutors to run the course that's really very exciting fun. yeah yeah very very exciting oh brilliant so that will all be on the website once it launches yeah yeah so hopefully maybe end of march we should be able to sort of send out emails to people um, let them know the course is happening. We're quite keen to get people who haven't trained to be therapists or anything, just new people, um, and support them. And obviously, they'll have the support of Barton and uh, as well, which is hopefully going to be the well. It's is often the thing that's missing <laughs> uh, for students who, because what what happens is they kind of go, they go on the course, they may not know of any real support, um, and then something happens, you know, maybe two years down the road. Um, or oh, well, the first year they're kind of looking around thinking, what, 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 yeah. have, I, what have I done? <laughs> so, where am I? Yeah. Going? <laughs> you know, and they spent big money to be there and they spent you know, the first six months looking around. So, yeah, I just want to hopefully find um, an easier entry into that and, and, and a sort of supportive community uh, if that's what um, they, if they feel able to access that. Um, available as well so hopefully get, get you know another extension to the mentoring program but in a slightly different way yes that well that's a good point it is another extension to that mentoring part but oh what a great resource so i'm looking forward to seeing that mm. and also it's something i'll put a link to or even on my website because i certainly want to help to support people to find this resource as well mm -hmm. um, maybe, I know maybe people are looking. yeah definitely yeah. Great. I'll definitely do that. Thank you. you but this has been that. such a great interview. I'm so happy that you joined me today. And thank you so much. I hope you come back sometime in the future. Good mm -hmm. luck with everything. And thank you for supplying uh, all these wonderful resources for people of color and those who really, really need it. and don't know where to look. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sean. It's been a pleasure. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Peaches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, your body, and your soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert practitioner, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations 
infused with highly suggestible hypnosis to rid yourself of anxiety, fear, stress, and negative thinking. These guided meditations can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your everyday life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.